From WSL Pure, this is One Ocean. Hey everyone, Reese here. Stoked to get into this week's conversation with Ethan Estes, but first I just want to say thanks so much to everyone who listened, subscribed, shared, rated, and reviewed our first episode. It's really fun to see the excitement around this little podcast, and we're excited to build this with you. So if you have interesting people we should talk to, ideas for us, shoot us a note at oneocean at wslpure.org. And if you haven't yet subscribed, rated, reviewed, please do. It really does help get this thing off the ground and helps us reach more people with ocean literacy. This week, uh, we're talking to Ethan Estes. We recorded this conversation a couple months ago at the Ohana Festival, where Ethan was showing off his then latest work that he did in partnership with Alex Weber and the team at The Plastic Pickup. We heard from Alex in episode one, and if you haven't already, I do encourage you to go back and give that a listen as well, as it sets up a lot of this chat with Ethan. Ethan is a marine scientist, he's an artist, he's a surfer, he's an incredible force for good within the ocean conservation space, and Ethan's art has been featured at a number of World Surf League events. I'm really lucky to have gotten to know him over the last couple years, Um, and he has this really interesting background, including shark and tuna research around the world. And even though I've known Ethan for a while, I still learn a bunch from him every time we chat. I learned a lot in our conversation here, and uh, give a listen, and we'll catch you at the end for this week's ocean news and other updates. Okay. Here's Ethan. Ethan, great to sit down finally. I know you've been busy grinding on this project and a number of projects, but for our audience listening, who are you? Hey, Reese. <laughs> it's good to be here. This is like the most chill moment I've had in a while. Um, uh, my name is Ethan Estes. I'm an artist and marine scientist from Santa Cruz, California, and it's good to be down here in Dana Point for the Ohana Fest. Nice, man. Um, I'm going to hit you with a really, what I think might be a hard question right off the bat, because right. why, why wait till the end? Mm-hmm. If you had to choose science or art for the rest of your life, career, time on this planet, what would it be? Uh, well, that's the whole point, is that I, I, I haven't had to choose, and I built my life, so I haven't had to choose. So I spend summers doing tuna research in Japan with the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and I love that work, but I'm always itching to be in the studio really so i i spend the rest of my year making art out of marine debris and trash to try and tell stories about the ocean and so i built my whole lifestyle around the ocean around surfing and my love of research and art so i never want to choose i never want to choose between art and science i don't have to yeah <laughs> that's a great answer yeah. to not answer <laughs> yeah right yeah, yeah. well let's 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 get, let's get into your story a little bit um what came first for you though i, I you know i imagine at some point there was kind of one of the other became a major influence or what did you pursue? I mean, obviously you, you have an academic background, do the marine science part, which came first? Uh, surfboards. Uh, <laughs> I grew up making surfboards. Um, I just got in into Santa it. Cruz. Right? In Santa Cruz. Yeah. yeah. I, I saw a friend doing it and I, I, I was like, oh, well, if he's doing it, I can do it. Uh, so I was about 13 and started making boards and just, you know, they weren't good, but it was fun. And the process of taking a you know rough chunk of foam and turning it into something magical was, you know, I, I got hooked and all I really wanted to do was be a surfboard shaper but my dad was like whoa 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 (laughs) like don't do that uh, <laughs> <laughs> why <laughs> well it's only a li- it's only a little toxic and uh yeah i did it, it ultimately ended up doing the, the the next more toxic and lower paying option which is art uh, <laughs> but it's all good um but the thing i couldn't ignore was that soaking you know your toes in the water in northern california you, you think about great white sharks and we are lucky to have a healthy population of great white sharks and i had a marine biology teacher in high school who turned that fear and you know just apprehension into curiosity and i got hooked on understanding everything i could about great white sharks so that's why i ultimately went down the marine science um, path as opposed to being a surfboard shaper and um i went to stanford to study uh, great white shark ecology and that transitioned into my tuna research these days so why did you transition from sharks to tuna um, turns out they're really similar. They're both, uh, in this case of convergent evolution where these two, you know, very disparate groups develop the same adaptations. So both white sharks and bluefin tunas, for example, are warm blooded, um, highly migratory, and they have a lot of the same anatomy internally. So the lab I was working with for a lot of years focused on that physiology. And it was, a. I I ended up getting a job is the answer. Uh, <laughs> I, I studied, <laughs> I studied white sharks in undergrad and masters, and that was great work. And I loved sitting on little boat watching 18 foot white sharks circle around and you know tagging them that was pretty fun work but you know it was just kind of undergrad deal i got a job offer from the monterey bay aquarium right out of college and out of my master's and i got to 
you know, it was not as sexy as the shark work, um, but bluefin are super interesting. And it's taken me all over the world to, you know, bluefin are everywhere from Mexico to Nova Scotia to Japan. And I, I love that, that work. So, and they are th- severely threatened. They're down to about 4% of their historic level. Wow. Um, so it's a, it's a big issue and they're, they're an interesting fish to study. But when, when yeah. you, de- when you define a historic level, mm-hmm. when is that? Um, that would be pre-industrial fishing. So really it's like 1950s for bluefin. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel like. You know, you'll see those photos of giant bluefin, you know, on a dock somewhere with a bunch of proud fishermen hooked by the tail and look at this giant thing. And sure. I feel like we just don't see those anymore. Yeah, it's, it's there's certainly a, an effect there where you kind of fish fish down the population to a point where there's not as many big individuals. Um they're making a recovery is one thing I should say that based on the work we're doing in Japan, uh, tagging and releasing these fish. And then also you can see you know record years of, of recreational fishing off of San Diego and such. The bluefin are coming back. Interesting. What's driving that? Um, I would say finally some regulation. You know, this basically the per seine fishery off Mexico has reduced its catch significantly. That's probably a dur- What's a per seine? Per seine is like this giant net um, that has like a purse string on it. So you can use a spotter plane, an airplane, find a school of tuna, motor up to them and wrap this entire, you know, you know, giant school of fish and cinch it up and uh, process them. So that's like really efficient, too efficient. Yeah. <laughs> Think about what you just said, right? So you're just like casually like, so a spotter plane goes out, tracks down this fish, then you get the boat and then you just like scoop them all up really mm-hmm. quickly. <laughs> All of that is incredible technology that yeah. didn't exist. You know, we talking about that historical record. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that I, th- I think I've seen in my lifetime is um, the battle between the fishermen and the regulators mm-hmm. and the scientists. Yeah. Scientists saying the fisheries are suffering, uh, regulators trying to regulate, and fishermen saying, hey, there's plenty of fish out yeah. there. <laughs> but guess what? In the time that, uh, you know, these populations have declined, our technologies to catch them have like you know gotten better and better and better and we're using more and more of it we're we're going further offshore using trackers using all sorts of you know fish aggregating devices etc and you know like the fish haven't they haven't developed technology they're just out there you know so we think that oh or the it feels as if oh there's plenty of fish out there but our ability to catch them has gotten better Mm -hmm. and the populations are still declining at least from where i sit. i don't know you're you're more expert on this but that's been my sort of no that's that's exactly right and i think you summarized the concept of uh, the shifting baseline that what each generation thinks is a normal level of fishing effort a normal fish population size is actually it may actually be severely depleted relative to their you know grandparents generation and so that's kind of the that's how these populations are able to slip from healthy to overfished which is where we are right now with with pacific bluefin and many other species and Uh, so what's the importance for someone listening who um doesn't eat tuna or isn't connected to the ocean or just hasn't thought about it much because you know we're all busy with our day-to-day lives what is the connection of pacific bluefin and or great white sharks to me as a surfer ocean goer other than i don't want to get bit by a shark i don't want to be one of the maybe 10 people who get bit per year or you know i mean like what is the actual connection of that species? What happens if we lose bluefin? For sure. Well, bo- in both those cases, those are top predators. And I was lucky to work with uh, this project called the Tagging of Pacific Predators Project, which outfitted a wide range of species, everything from blue whales, leatherback turtles, great white sharks, bluefin, albatross, into uh, w- with these electronic trackers that studied their movements and migrations. And w- you learn a couple of things. One, the California current, where we we're lucky to call home, is a very important place ecologically. All of these top predators return to this healthy ecosystem, this productive ecosystem to uh, gain nutrition and to to mate, to do all types of different behaviors. So the animals are telling us about the ecosystem. And basically, top predators are really exerting top-down control on the ecosystem. So let's think of an example from, I'd say, South Africa. They eliminated a huge amount of the shark biomass through culling programs and shark control programs. And what do you know? There's a huge... uh, um, you know, a ton of smaller sharks growing up uh, that, you know, turns out big sharks eat small sharks. So you get all these small sharks and they're eating bait and they're basically creating these uh, cascading effects into the ecosystem. And there's the cow nose ray problem on the East Coast where you remove the sharks and top predators, all these rays, you know, blow up and then they're eating all the oysters and 
the shellfish. So I think what happens when you remove top predators is you, you're you monkeying with a system that is incredibly complex. And those downstream impacts can have real impacts on communities. So that's the, the, the high level concept of why overfishing of top predators is bad. Yeah, for sure. I mean, to any of the fishing communities, of course, you know, if a, if a, if a fishery gets imbalanced and that's a a real uh, pain, but there can also be actual kind of uh, biological and ecological problems. If you you have a species that gets out of balance and now it wipes out an entire, you know, trophic level, so to speak. So, you know, or even just looking at some of the less on the animal front, but if you look at what the the blob, right, the Mm -hmm. marine heat wave a few years ago did to the Pacific ocean and um, how it wiped out certain species and then which species are now coming back in full force and yeah. um you know wiping out all the kelp right all those urchins are now totally. <laughs> wiping out all the kelp and um, that was a result of the sea otters right because yeah. the sea otters eat the urchins mm-hmm. but the sea otters all died as a result of the, did i have that right because you're more the expert in this area historically yes uh the over the over harvest of sea otters allowed urchins to proliferate right um because they weren't getting eaten and urchins devour kelp so um that's where a lot of our kelp forests have gone yeah into urchins it's bonkers. It's it's crazy how interconnected it all is. I it mean, is, I, it you is. know, and and when we think about the change that humans have had on the planet in a very short time. Yeah, and 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 um, you know, I didn't explain the bluefin tuna overfishing element uh, too well, but like it's the the takeaway is that these things are really complex, and that if you start removing important <laughs> elements of an ecosystem, there will be changes, and we can't really predict what they are. But we do know that it's sensitive to, you know, overfishing in general can have cascading impacts. Totally. Uh, yeah. Now you're doing work in Japan with mm-hmm. this tagging, releasing. Is that, how has that gone? Because I imagine that there's probably a keen interest in trying to learn about the species. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously Japan is the sushi capital of the world. Sure. And, you know, that the, the, the fish market there is, mm-hmm. is pretty intense. <laughs> um, top dollar going for um, bluefin tuna coming in from around the world. Um yeah. What's that like working over there, uh, and and what's that experience? And what do you are you seeing any changes over time, or are they improving their practices? Mm-hmm. It's one of the things I love about um, keeping one foot in the marine biology space and not just diving full in in the art stuff. Is that I gain a lot of of uh, personally I gain a lot of meaningful experiences by engaging in a new culture. Like I have been in Japan for the past four years. And it's been also really uh, educational for me um, in terms of my attitude about overfishing and um, the pr- pathways to recovery for for overfished species. It, it's really cultural, you know. That's where that's where change begins. It's a cultural phenomenon, and I'm been lucky to be in Japan at a time when working there, when the culture is changing. So the first year I went to Japan, there was essentially no regulation whatsoever for bluefin tuna fisheries. That if you got a what year was that? Uh, that would have been four years ago, so 2014. Wow. Um, 2015. Um, so you know, if a fisherman caught a you know f- <laughs> 10 pound bluefin tuna, it was going in the cooler. Um, and this is a I'm working with a very small scale fishery, kind of 30 30 or so individuals. But a 10 pound bluefin tuna is how old? Um, it's... Maybe not even a year. Or right. A year. Because yeah. a, a bluefin can get up to, I mean, several tons. It depends on which species. Or, Atlantic can, bluefin can be up to that. Uh, we've seen them like fifteen hundred pounds. Fifteen hundred pounds. and release them. If we wow. had killed that fish that we tagged, it, it would have been a world record rod and reel fish. But there's a relationship between the length of a fish and its weight. So we measured it alive. And it was about three hundred thirteen centimeters long, uh, so over ten feet. And uh, we released it, and it swam from Nova Scotia to the Gulf of Mexico, spawned, and kept going. But the world record fish was caught about a mile from where we were, and that was a 1,400-pound fish or so. 1,400 pounds. So they're huge. They're huge. They're so cool. Wow. And uh, the Pacific bluefin maxes out a little over 1,000 pounds. But Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, these fish are long-lived. They can be over 25, 30 years old, and they don't really start really spawning, like producing a lot of offspring um, until they're in the you know 12 years old. Um, when you catch a fish, and they're at that size, they're going to be maybe 250, 300 pounds. So the the shift is in the age of capture right now. The, the Japanese fisheries are saying, hey, if a fish is um, below 30 kilos, uh, you cannot keep it. So si- roughly 60 pounds. That's great. And I've been watching for the past, you know, since that rule went into place a few years ago, guys are throwing bluefin tunas back in Japan, right out of the net, just ch- chucking it back. And those fish are going to go on and spawn and create more bluefin. So there's an investment in the fishery now in Japan that is really going well, I'd say. 
and I would like to see it go go bigger and be more effective, but it's working. That's amazing. It's That's cool. so cool. Yeah, it's really cool. It's I've got some videos of fishermen throwing bluefin back in Japan. People a couple years ago, people said, "Yeah, good luck." Like that's never going to happen. But it's changing. It's a cultural shift, and that happens at a high diplomatic level, uh, where these regional fisheries uh, management organizations they have these long negotiations, and there has to be political will on both sides to to agree. And they basically the U.S. and Japan agreed to rebuild the stock together because bluefin. I should have mentioned earlier, they might, they're born in Japan, they swim to San Diego, they grow up here, and then they swim back to spawn. So we have this interconnected resource, which we have to work together to, to manage. So, right, because if one side's fishing it out at one stage. And that's been the history, yeah. Right. So um, it's finally kind of coming around. That's it, incredible. It's a good story. Yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, that's the thing, right? If we put some time and energy and effort into understanding these things and then put some policies in place, like we can it live can in really harmony work. with the ocean. We can <laughs> yeah. still, you know what I mean? You can have your fish and eat it too. You know, it, it, it's, <laughs> it, it's just about managing a resource. Um, I'm Do you not, have that on a shirt or something? I mean, you can we have should. your fish yeah, and eat it too. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, th there's, there's a real balance with conservation where when I'm in Japan, they don't like the word conservation because it has a connotation of no take. You can't, you can't do this. But what they like to call is sustainable resource management. At the end of the day, I'm like, perfect. Let's go for that. Call it whatever call you it want. Call it what you want. And that means there's a sustainable level of fishing that you can ha harvest and also allow the ecosystem to be intact. And that is, I'm, I'm totally cool with that. That's awesome. So your your work, um, you're working fisheries. Uh, and then when did you start producing art? Um, I mean, obviously crafting surfboards at a young age is, you know, art. Yeah. I mean, that's what it was. That, that, that I, I wouldn't have considered it art at the time. I just wanted to make boards that worked and look, look cool. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I went to, do you to, still have some of your boards? By the yeah, way? I have my first board sitting in my room. And what was it? Uh, I modeled it after a Rob Machado Eagle wing from El nice. and it looked nothing like a Rob Machado <laughs> Eagle wing from El but it was fun. And, uh, I went to Stanford and all I want to do is make boards like in my, you know, I took my marine science classes, but then I was like, anybody got a shop I can work in? And they're like, yeah, no kid. Like no, you can't use toxic materials where other people are working here. Uh -huh. It's the volatile or organic compounds, the fiberglass dust, no way. But like take an art class, do something else. I'm like fine. <laughs> and I did. And I had a professor who got me into the concept of using reclaimed materials uh, early on. And she encouraged me to say, you know, don't just make utilitarian things like surfboards. That's all I wanted to do. She's like, just try and tell a story do something, communicate something. And it just, the the switch flipped and I haven't looked back. You know, I haven't, I've made a few surfboards since, but not many. Right. And it's all of my energy has gone into that exact process that she, she led me towards, which is use using reclaimed materials to tell stories. And that's that's been my niche. That's been my passion ever since. What were some of your first... Um projects or some of your first mediums you know because i mean i've i've seen your work across a number of mediums you're using reclaimed stuff all over the place you're in print you're in sculpture you know what, what kind of what got you started it's kind of come full circle which is kind of i've reflected on this recently after making the golf ball wave that same professor you know once she told me to just try and tell a story i'm like okay i've seen a lot of cardboard filling up in the dumpsters around campus i'm gonna fill up my truck and make something out of it and i made this i hot glued this like eight foot tall wave you know and it was it was pretty heavy actually um tons of cardboard than this thing. I raided all the fraternities, like, you know, uh, dumpsters and got, got all this cardboard. And it was cool. You could stand in it. It was interactive and it wasn't that cool, but it, it told a story. And <laughs> it, it was like, it kind of was the first step towards on this journey I've been on of trying to engage people with art in a way of, you know, thinking about our material choices and yeah, recycling and such. Nice. And then, you know, you continued on. I mean, I've seen a few of your pieces and we can link to your website and some of your work, but I mean, you have that one um, super shiny tuna like it's almost like a disco ball basically yeah what's the story behind that one um you know that's one of the few pieces i've done that's kind of a crossover between my tuna world and uh, my research world and my art world right um i made that piece it's a 450 pound bluefin tuna model out of fiberglass and i covered it in about fifty thousand rhinestones by hand in a week because i had a deadline <laughs> and it was gnarly <laughs> yeah <laughs> in, in my parents living room i didn't have a studio yet and they're just like oh boy what's what are you doing with your life <laughs> and um yeah that was gnarly uh was, next to the golf ball wave that was maybe the psychologically most challenging project i've ever done because it was like a week of no sleep and just bedazzling um <laughs> Uh, Ethan S's. Yeah, that's it. Bedazzler. Oh, I, I will never bedazzle again. Tuna, yeah. be, tuna bedazzler. <laughs> never again. <laughs> but it's cool. I mean, the thing, it's giant. It, it looks cool. It first looks cool. of all. <laughs> Thanks. And where'd it you, was worth it. Where did yeah. you premiere that? And what was the story there? It was an international symposium on bluefin tuna conservation that was held in Monterey. And I made that piece for a nonprofit I've done work with called the Tag a Giant Foundation. And uh, 
the goal was to make it, there, there were several other artists who had the same exact tuna model and they painted them and did different things. And it was to raise awareness about, uh, you know, the beauty of bluefin tuna and also the you know, need to protect them. And it was cool to kind of get all the nerds and the managers at this conference stoked on something a little more creative and that told a story as opposed to just the dry science side of things. Yeah. Yep. It's amazing. I mean, I've seen it hanging in your studio <laughs> and it's still incredible. It's an eye catcher. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for <laughs> sure. You can say that. <laughs> Hey, a quick break from our conversation to give a shout out to Outer Known. They sponsor this podcast because they care about the ocean too. That's shown in their clothing, which is all made from organic cotton, recycled and regenerated fibers, doesn't use a lot of water in the process or dyes, and is made by people who are paid a fair wage. I love their stuff. I'm rocking an Outer Known t-shirt that my wife gave me right now. It's super comfy, stylish, durable, and I feel good knowing that it was made responsibly. Outer Known was actually founded by pro surfer and 11-time world champion Kelly Slater, who was determined to create a clothing company who made clothing responsibly. And you don't have to be a surfer to wear Outer Known. It's really stylish. They have great threads for men and women. And you can go to OuterKnown.com today and enter the code OCEAN at checkout. And you'll get 25% off your full price order. That's OuterKnown.com, O-U-T-E-R-K-N-O-W-N.com. And remember to use the code OCEAN at checkout for 25% off. Check them out today. OuterKnown.com. And don't forget, promo code OCEAN for 25% off. Now, back to our conversation. So you've done a little bit of work with your tuna research, but a lot of your work in the last few years has focused on plastic and plastic pollution. Yep. Uh, was that a conscious shift or was it kind of reacting to our overall societal shift where we're going, oh, we're aware of this problem finally, or more people are aware of it? Mm. You know, What was the first sort of, when did you first start to dive into that? Or were you always there? Because you mentioned that you were always working and reclaimed. I, I w- it's hard to say where the first, where, where I started caring about plastic pollution i would actually that's not true i I know exactly when i started caring about plastic pollution (laughs) take that back (laughs) i was 17 years old i spent a summer by myself because i was kind of being a bad kid i stopped applying myself in classes and uh, my parents were like whoa 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 like grades are going down this kid's bad (laughs) attitude they said all right if you learn a language, we're going to send you somewhere else, but um, anywhere you want, if you pull your grades up. Uh, so there's a carrot. And uh, if you go by yourself. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so I Googled early days of Google and I went and I ended up staying on this with this little family on the beach in Ecuador for two months. And I learned Spanish and um, I traveled around by myself and gained some like, you know, personal skills. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I just, every day I'd walk this beach and it was totally loaded with trash. And growing up in Santa Cruz in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, we have some debris, but it's not a lot. And every day there'd be a dead, a new dead turtle washing up. And so this was like popping my bubble of like, whoa, the world is not all... <laughs> all gravy and it's all clean and such so that's when i knew that that was kind of where i needed to put my energy i wanted to put my energy and uh i use the word die when did i first dive into plastic pollution in in my art i made a sculpture in 2012 that was was probably one of my most you know my most proud sculptures at this point it was a big whale tail sculpture we actually brought it to the surf ranch yeah the last dive at the farallon yeah that's it that's it so I was soaking on the Great White Shark boat, and that was, it was 2011, maybe 2012. And um, there's no sharks. We're out the Farallon Islands. These, the Devil's Teeth, they're called. These jagged-looking rocks covered in bird poop, and there's no <laughs> sharks. So it's pretty boring, honestly. It's like fishing, but you know, no catching. And but there are. I mean, that's yeah, what fishing is for yeah. a lot of people, to be honest. <laughs> Fair enough. That's what fishing is for me. <laughs> it's just standing around by the water with a pole. Yeah, well, it's not very exciting, but it was cool because there were a lot of whales around. And one of the researchers who I really respect. It was like, no, man, I remember a couple years ago, I watched this whale just drown right in front of me. It was caught in the crab lines and it was like on its last legs uh, and he just watched it drown. And it, it, he told me that story. Kind of, it was just a heavy moment. And I was doing a, a, a residency at the landfill in San Francisco at the same time. So I was... Sorry, back up. Explain a residency <laughs> at the landfill. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. I mean, I spent uh, four months pretty much working out of the landfill in San Francisco. What's the name of that program? I know that... Recology. Yeah. Right. That's right. The Recology. Um, artist in residence program. Yeah, yeah what a fascinating thing i mean give a, give a top line explanation of the program because i think it is really cool it's been going for about 20 years and basically they give artists legal access to trash which it's totally unsafe right so it's huge liability yeah you have no idea what's in there yeah so they they you sign your life away and they make you buy <laughs> they give you a hard hat and a yellow vest and a shopping cart and you have to dodge the tractors and and toxic stuff and it's like Candyland. You just pick out whatever you want, and it's simultaneously super depressing 
for the first three weeks you're just kind of bummed out because yeah. it's like this giant you know basketball court size area gets filled 10 feet thick with trash and that gets carted away and that happens about a couple times a day and it's like the scale of it you see the the seasons the the holidays the trends it all comes through the landfill and it just trips you out but then you can flip it on its head and be like this is a gold mine of cool material i found a bunch of old fishing rope in that pile of trash when i was working there and i turned that into a sculpture that was a, a whale tail diving down into a big coil of rope and it kind of worked you know it kind of kind of showed a little bit of it was kind of dynamic the whale was going down and it it kind of it was kind of a successful piece it ended up getting shown at the the airport in San Francisco for, you know, maybe 5 million people to see for about a year. And uh, I was only, I hadn't even graduated college yet. So it was a, it was a big breakthrough for me. That's awesome. I mean, like I can do this. And that's what encouraged me to keep going in art. I would have maybe gone on for a PhD or something, but I, I just want to make art. Yeah, man, that's so cool. I mean, you, you just touched on dumpster diving and kind of being <laughs> at, at the dump, right? And it's funny because I remember as a kid, we used to have to take our trash to the dump in my town. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in Cape Cod, it, we didn't have curbside. And so you had to bring it. And my dad and I would go and we we would almost always go poke around. Yeah. We, you, it wasn't actually off limits. Now, this wasn't a city. You know, it was a small town. But we would go poke around and like find stuff. I remember finding pitchers for, for my mom, oh, like cool. uh, like for pouring mm -hmm. water. My mom had like a collection of pitchers. My mom collects everything. Cool. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> And, um, <laughs> and, and, uh, we, we, I remember we scored some pitchers this one time, these kind of like, um, you know, tin pitchers or whatever. And my mom was so stoked and yeah. it's just kind of a funny thing, but it's when you see garbage in mass like that, you know, cause in our day to day lives, we've been so separated from that process. Most mm -hmm. of us, it's, you throw it in your little trash bin and then you dump it into whatever your bin and your building or your curbside and you only do that. But it's when you see it as like this whole this mass. Yeah. landfill you mm -hmm. go whoa or you know i've been to the um the recycling facility in brooklyn mm. for new york city cool and i heard that's you, amazing it's intense yeah, yeah. yeah you see it all and you go wow like yeah. this is the system mm -hmm. or you know we took the wsl staff we took some of them to the santa monica recycling cool. facility one day awesome. we, we did a little field trip perfect and when everybody saw it and you know see saw that the process is human sorted they go yeah. whoa and you kind of that's when it really makes you think so yeah um those those programs are really important. I think that's so cool that you had that experience to work with Recology to then, you know, make art out of it and communicate to a wider audience. Yeah, it's, it's not something you get to see every day, you know, yeah. and, and that's by design, really. Yeah. Nobody wants to see it. Right. Um, but in, in, it is, it kind of, it pops that bubble of magical thinking that there is in a way, you know, that even you throw something in the trash can or the recycling for that matter, that it just, you know, it's gone. It's nobody's problem. Yeah, there it's, is no it's, way. It's many other people's problems, really. There's Part of what I took away from working at the landfill was making a lot of friends there. And, you know, these people bear the brunt of our collective decision making, you know, and it's and there's some really colorful characters, you know, really, really interesting people. The coolest thing about the San Francisco landfill is that they have a falconer on staff because there's thousands and thousands of seagulls that they have to deal with. And the coolest guy there is the falconer. So he unleashes his falcons and they scare away the seagulls for a while. And it's this endless game of cat and mouse. But that's uh, amazing. Yeah, you know, it's just like things you don't think about that that's part of our system that we have now and we we can do a lot better you know i mean the whole concept of a circular economy is is an attractive one especially when you see the scale of waste that almost yeah. everything we use is designed without thinking about what happens to it after we use it which is just strange you know if totally. you step in back from it it's just bizarre so uh I'm, I'm interested in in learning more about that myself and trying to promote that to the extent that it's a good idea yeah well so that brings us to you know you you've since that whale tail i feel like been super embraced by the ocean conservation community or i, I don't know you were already there, but just in the last couple of years, the way I see your work at the Inertia Evolve Summit and at the Global Wave Conference, and you know, we had you do a sign for for WSL Pure, mm -hmm. and you know, it's just kind of like it's such beautiful stuff, and it's a really cool story to be a part of. Um, but then we brought it to last year, we brought it to the North Shore yep. with the help of Kukua Hawaii and Sustainable Coastlines and Boreo and a bunch of groups. I mean, how did that? I'm trying to remember back. How did this project even come together? Where, 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 no, you know what? It comes back from the Surf Ranch, wasn't it? Because you brought the whale to to the surf ranch for the surf ranch pro that's right and we showed it off yep and then i remember right after you went wouldn't it be cool if there's a wave here what if mm -hmm. we did a wave we did a whole art right. install like, there's all these people <laughs> and yeah that's right you you, you like it was the Good week memory. after and you, you you sent me sketches and you're like hey that's wouldn't right. it be cool if we did this thing and i was like oh that'd be kind of cool like yeah <laughs> and, you know like okay yeah let's think about this thing and then it was you know later that year it started to come together and basically kim and jack Johnson, mm -hmm. who are incredible supporters of, of this message, 
college. Yeah. I think kind of they were the ones who really helped you get going. Or I, I yeah. don't know. I don't remember. All I remember is all of a sudden there were phone calls with all of us getting in, and we're like, we're gonna do this. We're gonna bring a wave to pipeline. It was cool, man. That was that was uh, looking back it was incredibly uh, lucky and special time. Um, I think uh, you're exactly right that we we were talking about making this wave at for the surf ranch, but then we just realized that we're gonna have to ship all this trash from sustainable coastlines Hawaii. Yeah, because we wanted to, to do California. the pickup in Hawaii. Yeah, well, it, that's you know personally, it's one of the places we could go up to Alaska and find that kind of waste, but mainly it's not as much. Um, we're, we're distant from the gyre and such so yeah it just didn't it didn't seem feasible and then it was like well what if we just build it in hawaii and that worked you know that set up the the possibility of working with kokua and jack and kim and it all just started to, to fall into place so that was really lucky because that project was the culmination of everything i've been wanting to do with my work and um kind of moving into this next one too into for the waves the golf ball wave uh, it was it was it was a public uh, you know, interactive experience. And that for me, art shouldn't be locked away for nobody to see it. It, it has to be shared uh, to have an impact. And that we succeeded on that. I think we had like, we, ca- we tallied it up as like 4 million views and just a lot of good engagement. We did so many um, school assemblies on the North Shore, getting kids stoked, field trips to see the wave in progress. Yeah. So let's back up on the process a little mm-hmm. bit. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, you have Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, nonprofit based mm-hmm. on the North Shore there. Uh, you've got Kakua Hawaii Foundation. And also uh, behind it um, and a few of us who also sponsored it but basically sustainable yep. coastlines ran cleanups mm-hmm. right well they always are running massive totally. cleanups and they take cleanups to the next level they're yeah. just like we're going big not like just picking up none of this five minute beach clean yeah we're gonna go take <laughs> ghost nets down that are washing up on our on our shoreline and it's hard um, it's hard work yeah they're yeah. they're gnarly like they go for it yeah. you know um kahi did an amazing job yeah. uh, of getting that that group off the ground and um you know they're they're a force mm-hmm. and so you were taking that material mm-hmm. um you were also engaging school kids Right. Um, right. Cause it's a plastic free Hawaii initiative from Kukua. Yeah. So you're That's engaging right. schools Yep. and I'm trying to like do it all from memory <laughs> you're uh, on it. and you're also assistant. Um, so you're <laughs> engaging schools in the pickups and then speaking to the kids and making art with the kids True. in the schools. That's right? right. That's right. Um, which is so cool. There were so many levels of community engagement. It was, you know, that that's the real beauty of bringing in the different partners that we had was that on one level we had WSL with this big event, the pipe masters, tens of thousands of people coming through um, Ehukai Beach Park to experience the art directly. But then we had all this back-end education work with the local schools um, and follow-up visits, field trips. And that was really Kokua Hawaii Foundation with that youth education element that personally was like, the most one of the most re- rewarding parts of it just getting kids stoked and um yeah and then we had it at turtle bay resort after the events yeah um, so it was there for three months so well, hang on before we get to yeah. after the event so, <laughs> so you do all the pickups you engage the community mm-hmm. and then you built this wave i mean you like moved to the north shore for what six <laughs> weeks or something i mean it's, not the worst place to be stationed right, for right. a while but i i remember messaging with you and you're like barely surfing it was so it was such a shame i was like oh yeah. are you scoring and you're like no man i'm yeah. like grinding on this wave <laughs> surface level sounds so good oh yeah just being an artist working on the north shores for it's like seven weeks no big deal and, i stopped and, by and you guys were like masks on oh, like mosquitoes you know, man just yeah. getting gnarly bit of, <laughs> um like cuts from the rope like rope yeah. burns trying to build this thing it was hard and you so you essentially built a, a, a replica of pipeline that's what we did um i, I built it kind of like you would a skate ramp that was and with almost like a full pipe section and i knew that if i was going to make a sculpture of pipeline at pipeline i had to go big and it it had to be proper so it was a big barrel and you could stand up in it and put a board in there made of reclaimed wood and most of the sculpture was old commercial fishing gear that's you know mostly what sustainable coastlines collects Mm -hmm. a lot of single-use stuff as well um but a bulk of it you know the was rope and, and fishing nets and floats. Those are all byproducts of the tuna fisheries that operate in the Pacific. And so that was the, that was the, you know, it, it worked. You could interact with it. You could get up there. It was fun. You could get your barrel shot and it looked cool. But then you, you, you know, the switch would flip and be like, this is actually pretty heavy. Like this, this is a heavy wave um, in, in many ways. And that was what I wanted. You know, I think that mental back and forth of this is engaging. This sucks. That's where critical thought happens. You know, that's where ideas and uh, energy uh, gets created to make change so that was really special and that's what led into the golf ball wave ultimately is wanting to make a similar experience here on the mainland but like i mentioned we don't have the rope we don't have that quantity fortunately of material that washes up that i can work with anyway not somebody else could do it i'm not skilled enough to work with microplastics at that scale (laughs) 
but my friend Alex reached out with 50,000 golf balls. So yeah, so uh, that's what yeah. happened. <laughs> you should go listen to the episode with Alex Weber, uh, founder of the Plastic Pickup, talking about the story of the golf balls found uh, off Pebble Beach and how she collected them and, you know, uh, did a research paper to, you know, encourage action and drove action. And so I really encourage you to listen to that episode. We'll link to it in the show notes. But the wave that we're talking about here is for the waves. And so at the end of Alex's story, or not the end, but, you know. Um, the beginning. Yeah, yeah. it was... Uh, <laughs> I've got 50,000 golf balls that I collected off the coast of Pebble Beach Golf Course. Now what? Mm -hmm. And that was the question she kept getting. Well, what, do you, what do you do with them? Yeah. Uh, and so enter Ethan, introduced by uh, Matt, the researcher mm -hmm. from Stanford. That's and, right. Uh, was it a wave right off the bat? Did you think there could be other sculptures? I mean, you know, how, how did you concept the project? And then talk about the building of this thing, because I've been watching <laughs> it from afar and sometimes in the studio uh, for a while. So. It's it, it, it was the hardest thing I ever, it's the hardest thing I've ever personally done. Um, and I don't want to complain about it, but it was hard. <laughs> it kicked my butt. And when I, I saw you show up at the surf ranch last week, you looked, were fried. Yeah. I looked probably like a zombie, dude. I felt totally. like a zombie. Yeah. But, uh, but take us back and, and get us to the concept. And... Well, <laughs> I appreciate that. It, it's funny though. Cause when Alex, I got this email, Hey, I've got 50,000 golf balls in my garage. What do you want to do? You, you want to work with them? I wanted to say no. Like that is going to be the hardest thing ever. Like that. You, so you knew, I knew it was going to be horrible and it exceeded my expectations <laughs> yeah um, but you know it's all worth it in the end but i knew it was going to be hard you know that, that working in multiples of you know tens of thousands with the material that i've never worked with it's going to weigh two three thousand pounds on its own to make it portable make it stand up to the road you know the bumps on the road i was like this is going to be steel gonna have to have a steel structure gonna have to be on a trailer this is already getting expensive uh and wait why did it have to be on a trailer just to move it you yeah. know it's it's the golf balls golf balls are heavy yeah and to to support um anything whether it was a, a whale or a, a wave it was going to have to be steel and the whereas the pre previous one was on a wood frame and it was sectioned so that you could yes. kind of take it apart yes and it's still yeah the, the plastic free pipeline is really hard to move so that was kind of a learning lesson for me was I, I want to be able to say yes to more events and do more but moving the pipeline is super hard so yeah because we got asked if we could bring it to california as right. soon as we built it everyone said all right bring it to california <laughs> like, uh, and we're like oh man <laughs> easier yeah. said than done yeah you knew that this thing had to be durable built to last yep. on a trailer mm -hmm. steel structure and i mean i saw the frame of this thing it's a beast it had to i mean be. you're, you're yeah. like welding sheets of metal and all sorts of stuff it's more welding than i've ever done and that was fun i i, I enjoyed the shifting my focus towards a new skill um so those were the constraints up front but i had i said yes and the reason i said yes is because alex she her story is is so inspiring and it's a positive story which are so hard to come by unfortunately in the environmental space that it's david and goliath thing this young girl got pebble beach company <laughs> this massive multi-million dollar corporation to to change and that i think is going to have ripple effects throughout other coastal golf courses around the world and so i i couldn't pass that up you know just to be part of that and to help share that story you know it doesn't those opportunities don't just come knocking so as an artist i had to step up and be like this is going to suck, but let's do it and we did it i thought it was going to take three months it took six <laughs> i think we hit it I think the budgeting worked out pretty good. Um, so we got it, you know, we crowdfunded it with support of, of many partners. And it, it's it's been really rewarding to see it activate at the Surf Ranch and now this this weekend at Ohana Fest. Just seeing kids stoke out and get pitted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you! Um, so for, for the those in, in one, to back up on the, the Pebble Beach thing, I mean, mm -hmm. the impact that... You, Alex had is incredible and we're talking about in the lifetime of Pebble Beach um, that, that course there have been estimated two to five million golf balls hit golf balls into into that and that's just one coastal golf course mm -hmm. and so you think about any golf course that's near a river or an ocean um you know uh, that's a lot of balls lost to the environment yeah um or just to, to waterways let alone into sure. the forest sure. um talk about the, the the balls themselves they degrade they erode they turn this brown color so you're working with different stages of golf balls essentially mm -hmm. in your art but then also you had to figure out like how to put them together into mm -hmm. a thing i mean <laughs> half of your time probably was spent on figuring out just how to work with them yeah and yeah. so, and so what'd you do? I mean, you ended up drilling holes through them and then running steel cable or something. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, so the other reason I said yes is because it was an awesome challenge. I've never worked with golf balls before. And why, how would I have thought? To Are you a golfer? Not a golfer. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, never worked with this material before. And I, I love a challenge. So like, I feel good about working with rope. I enjoy working with old fishing rope. This was new. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. And so for, I, I, I kind of just meditate. I don't draw much. Um, I just kind of meditate on how things could work. And I tried to come up with a really strong um, vision of what it could look like. Uh, I think I sent you a sketch and it's not pretty. You know, it, it gets the point across, hopefully. Sure. But really the vision has to be in your head and to pull something like this off. And um, I was lucky to, I, I, I pr and you have to prototype. So I prototyped how to work with golf balls. How can you attach them? Can you screw them? Can you glue them? Whittled away at different concepts and ended up asking three UCSC students to drill holes in about 20,000 of these balls. And then we strung them up on eighth inch stainless steel rods so that we could um, structurally attach them without attached screwing into every single golf ball we did about every other one um i put about thirteen thousand screws into the sculpture within the past two three weeks it was a lot of elbow grease um <laughs> and it worked it, w it really worked it's structural it cruised down highway five bouncing around and it's all still tight and together so i'm pumped on that um and what was it like revealing it at at the freshwater pro it was a dream like i feel like i sent you like a like a photoshopped mock-up of what it could look like and then i turn around finally kind of get to turn around after six months of you know challenging work and it's like oh finally there it is you know like <laughs> for you know it, it worked um and it, it was worth it because it, it looked really good you know it, it finally came together in the end um and that's not just me you know like that's i i would say on this project i very much got dragged across the finish line um with the sculpture <laughs> by alex's family um by my family by my fiance community members who just showed up in the last two weeks to like put in a 10-hour day like wow like to take days off work to come help me like attach golf balls it was insane and i didn't i wasn't asking I, I was like i've got it i've got it no worries thanks guys and they're like yeah you don't got it and so they would just show up and help and this this that was the best part of it all was the community support so i think that's been a really cool thing to see from afar is the community that's built around this whether it's you know some of us from afar rooting you on kim and jack and you know others kind of you know cheering for you but the community that you've built and the team you know um you know toby and nevin and, and noah and you know the kids all hanging around alex Good kids. she knows yeah. from the island school who are just like yeah we're gonna go do this thing we're gonna dedicate our summer to it yeah um that's so impressive and seeing you know how important it is to build community around a solution yeah. uh you know and community around uh challenges and i think that's it's it's really cool it's super it was super fun to see I, me too man that was the best part um and now sharing sharing it is is kind of a cherry is that's not the cherry on top this is the this is it's it's working now it's doing its job but we never would have gotten here if, without those motivated kids <laughs> yeah <laughs> so totally. i'm grateful um, and so, so you, you build this thing, you bring it to the freshwater pro, um, we had it stationed there, but there was a little bit of concern when we were first talking about it of like, uh, is this going to be all right? Is this going to be cool? Cause you know, right. freshwater pros at the surf ranch, mm. surf ranch is a WSL, you know, <laughs> operation, but it's kind of Kelly's house. Right. And when I say Kelly, I mean, Kelly Slater, sure. the goat, the greatest of all time. <laughs> um, and it was a little bit like, well, we know Kelly loves golf. Mm -hmm. Uh, is he going to be into this thing or is he going to be a little bit whatever? And, yeah. um, you ended up messaging with him yeah yeah I, I felt like it was the right thing to do um uh what i tried to emphasize when i messaged kelly on instagram not knowing if that would work or not was that this is like not a golf shaming project this is a this is a positive story for pebble beach at the end of the day because they decided to listen to science listen to activism and change their ways they're they're picking up these golf balls as we speak and so i want to hold them up as you know a course that is doing the right thing and they're kind of the best course out there so maybe others will follow suit so i tried to emphasize that element to kelly and be like we're not trying to golf shame here this is this is golf positive um <laughs> and i think he 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 understood that which i'm grateful for and was like sure you know green light let's do it and uh we haven't gotten him in the barrel yet i actually ran into him last night at ohana fest and hopefully he can cruise by today but we'll, we'll find a time i mean we've but, got a slater designs board on there that was true. another you know we we reached out to our friends down at firewire and slater designs and we got is it a cymatic no it's what a is cymatic. it yeah, yeah we five, got five five it's beautiful uh, <laughs> but it's i mean i would say at this point it was dinged up it was unable to be that's sold tr that's true um, that, I, I didn't we want to use a fresh board oh that'd be a crime yeah <laughs> um, yeah, it was unable. Yeah, it was. It had some blemishes and such, so it wasn't retail quality, which is good. Um, it's probably gotten like twenty thousand people barreled at this point. Oh my I goodness! Mean, and I mean, I should do the math, but it's maybe more. Yeah, yeah. It, it's so cool, and, and you know, it, it's a funny thing. I think you know, this is one of the questions we had from a, a fan was around. You know, you you tend to make all your art interactive, mm. or at least it seems that way. A lot of it seems that way. At least these projects mm -hmm. and. 
how cool that is. It's like when you get up there and you stand on the thing and you realize like I'm in this barrel barreling wave of plastic, essentially yep. polluting the ocean. Um, it's got a, it's got a interesting moment. It just makes you think that this isn't okay. Yeah. And that's, that just gets into my core belief that, you know, people learn in different ways. And one of the, the, the value of art is that it can reach people where they are. They impose, you know, they, they can learn from it. They bring their experience to it. And if you do it right, they have an emotional connection to the idea. And that emotional connection is the core of behavior change that you can't get somebody to not hit a golf ball in the water if they don't think about it and they don't feel like it could have an impact. And then I think that has political and uh, ramifications from there that people vote accordingly. So that's my personal theory of change. And that's why I make my art interactive mostly is to get people that to connect. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so back to uh, Freshwater Pro. So we ended up getting kind of the okay from Kelly, which mm-hmm. was great. And okay is worth mentioning because Outer Known was the sponsor <laughs> of the event as well. And yeah. They're super sustainable. And so we kind of ran it past John Moore and the mm-hmm. crew and they were like, yeah, we want innovative ideas around sustainability for the event, uh, which is really cool to have you there in the Pure Village with you know other people who are doing interesting things, trying to make surfing more sustainable and just tell interesting stories to make us all think about it a little bit more. It, the Pure Village was sweet. We were in the right spot. It was like we're kind of hitting the messaging on every level with eco boards with Ray Harris and, and WSL pure. It's just in hydro flask and refillable stations. And then, you know, this interactive piece, it was, it was checking a lot of boxes. So, I, I think you planned that and it, it was it, it worked yeah <laughs> yeah it, it was a good experience it came together it was really fun yeah um, it was a really cool experience to have that many different people from the cigarette surfboards to sustainable mm-hmm. surf right. to ride to you guys all all a part of it which was awesome um it's fun so yes yeah, so you built this thing on a trailer mm-hmm. the thing can travel around oh actually no before we go on to ohana fest um tell me about the day after the freshwater pro and, yeah. and your experience there because <laughs> well, i saw some posts on instagram and one you got some sleep finally because yeah you, i mean literally you and alex and all the kids <laughs> you'd barely slept i showed up with coffees for you in the morning i think you were napping in the truck because yeah, you barely slept I, I was worried about you all driving down <laughs> you're all zombies but anyway you finally maybe got some sleep that night hopefully even though you were camping in the uh, surf ranch parking yeah. lot but maybe got some sleep but the next morning on instagram i saw some posts and i i just couldn't believe my eyes oh this is the golf balls we yeah found? oh yeah yeah that was fascinating um it turns out the surf ranch is built on uh an kind of an old golf course right and so it was almost like you know we weren't trying to like shame anybody it was just kind of like we were just excited to see like hey like this is an issue just about everywhere you name it you're gonna find a golf ball well so so what ethan's describing is i'm like wake up check insta and he's on his way over to you were gonna move the the wave yeah and i don't know how did you find one someone saw a golf ball and then you started digging yeah once you see one you start seeing them everywhere they're kind of they were embedded in the dirt they are yeah i think they filled a lot of the parking lot with some of the old sediment from the golf course next door and it just kind of you know golf balls when they, they land in the grass and the grass overgrows them and they're just kind of gone at that point right. you're never going to find it right so they moved that dirt and found thousands of golf balls apparently and you ended yeah. up with like 13 or something in your hands that oh morning. yeah and like a we just walk into our car yeah so i mean <laughs> it's not a problem per se right, right like right. And, and i should scaling back the whole golf ball thing is a small scale issue in the broader plastic pollution problem totally but it is also reflective of of like the out of sight, out of mind issue or mindset that causes this whole thing. And um, the golf balls, yeah, it was surprising to say the least to find a golf ball situation at the ranch. Um, I was cracking up. I thought it was hilarious. I I'm was glad like, you think wow, it's this, yeah. is, this is really funny. And um, I mean, we should collect a few of them and yeah. put them on display or something. It's interesting. Um, so you, you did that. You finally got a little bit more sleep this week. You look, you look feel way better. better. I feel better. Thank you. I feel better. <laughs> uh, um, you did a great job last weekend, but, uh, I was worried for you cause you just were pushing yourself. I mean, you showed up with cuts in your arms and just from yeah. all the late night work, but I hurt uh, myself at the end of the project. It's, it's always when it happens, you're like rushing and, uh, you know, metalworking, rushing with metalworking is never safe. And I, yeah, I stabbed myself with like a eighth inch metal rod, like two inches into my arm. And I'm like, Oh, tape it up. We're going to oh. keep going. <laughs> we're gonna make it to the ranch and you didn't even mention you were walking around with like a t-shirt wrapped around your arm it's, like I, somebody wouldn't notice i was like ethan or do you need to go to first aid you're like, i'm good i'm good I you know this. it was it, it was just a flesh wound we we're okay could have been, <laughs> been worse um, um yeah. and so now we're down here at ohana fest yeah and and uh brought down here uh in partnership with ohana fest as well as like hydroflask they've been a supporter of yeah 
almost all your work or at least these last two waves not sure. all your work but the, these two waves because they're a great partner in WSL and everything yep. um, they've, they've got the BYO bottle campaign going on here yep. trying to encourage music uh, concerts to be more sustainable um, who else is involved who else brought you here anybody I mean lots of people too many to name yeah, yeah. Uh, but those are the those are the big partners for this event yeah yeah and so now you're stationed right as people come into this event. So it's a three-day music festival down here. And there's a whole bunch of people coming through the door going, what, what is this thing? And walking over and interacting with it. It's cool. It's it's it, They put us literally like front and center, first thing you see when you walk into the festival, which at first I was like a little nervous. But it's, <laughs> you know, some people are, it's, it's kind of reflective of society in general. Like some people just want to go do their thing. They want to, you know, go get in the front row and that's what they're stoked for. Other people are, you know, interested and they're they're open-minded and they want to come check it out and uh they got nowhere to be so uh we've had really good interaction um thousands tens of thousands of people in the past couple of days so you know the slater board is holding up it's amazing uh, <laughs> I, no pressure dings it's like i think it should be an advertisement uh it, it's holding up man and the kids are the best i would say they just instantly take to it it's really tactile so they're like feeling yeah. it and stoking out and the adults turn into kids which is kind of my other favorite part where you get these <laughs> big rough looking dudes with like no way it's golf balls and uh <laughs> that kind of uh just awesome public interaction we have great volunteers kind of staffing the wave and yeah. you know really lucky to have them here my fiance included um and that yeah people are learning they're some people kind of get the surface level view of like hey those are golf balls okay and oh they're from the ocean okay but some people are there for 20 minutes asking questions and and they're golfers and they want to know what they can do and right. you get a range of interactions and it's almost all positive honestly it's been really good nobody's like oh golf shaming it's like no nope. which i that was a concern for me is that people were going to miss right the fact that this is a success story and they're going to miss that this was pebble beach stepping up and just be like oh these people hate golf and that's not the case so i think it's been just good vibes and hopefully knockwood stays that way yeah well you've got alex's dad rocking the uh the awesome uh, bill murray golf shirt <laughs> you know so he kind of positive vibes. fits right in there yeah it's a good one um we need to get this in front of bill murray maybe kelly can send it his way i bet and, they know each know, other yeah. yeah i would assume so <laughs> um what's next for 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 the waves for for the the project i mean it's on a trailer mm -hmm. we've talked about getting it around to different golf courses around the country mm -hmm. where would it be ideal for this thing to end up um i'm really excited we're getting a lot of interest for different events events um of a wide range we have a ocean technology conference they want us to come to we have a supply chain sustainability conference <laughs> they want us to come to so it's we're going to build out a tour schedule and activate the piece at different events moving forward i would really like to see it cross over into the golf world because that's where i want to see adoption of the preble beach protocol this cleanup protocol and that for me would be a real big win that i would be that that's what it needs to do it needs to cross over into the golf world get golfers excited about advocating for golf resorts to become plastic free institutions and to do cleanup at you know these golf courses so i'm hoping and i'm optimistic that's gonna it's gonna cross over kelly is i think the best possible ambassador for that as this high level high performance surfer and really high level golfer you know he he can tell that story he's committed to sustainability throughout our known and personally i'm excited for him to, to to put it out there and get his his audience thinking there's probably a lot of pro golfers in that audience so i'm i'm hoping he he can be our, our best crossover ambassador for this yeah we've hosted a few pros pro golfers at the surf ranch right. you know yeah. and uh done a little crossover and that's one of the beautiful things i think about surfing as a sport is it's so aspirational people really want to like be a part of it whether they're mm -hmm. a pro or they're just getting on a wave for the first time it's a fun thing to be engaged in and so we're able to use it as this vehicle to meet new people and bring them into the surfing world and then hopefully you know um you know help them change a little bit be more sustainable in their day-to-day -day life which is really cool so yeah it'd be rad to have kelly um be involved in this thing we'll see yeah and uh but i mean like i'm thinking about you know how do we get this thing to the right golf tournaments mm -hmm. you know where you have really hardcore golf fans to be out there and be a part of it and how do we take the pebble beach protocol to the next level yeah. um again not as the number one most threatening thing to the ocean but solvable though solve yeah i mean alex talked about point source you know and really knowing where those balls are coming from and ultimately it's just an, an incentive for golfers to to get better yeah keep, keep the ball on the course we guys. all want to get better yeah. 
So what are you excited about, um, you know, coming up in the year ahead? Um, it sounds like we're going to be back on the North shore for the pipe masters. So I'll whip something up for that. Nothing crazy. No, no big waves probably, but something fun. And, uh, stoked to do a lot of, uh, like, uh, high school and elementary school visits for that too. And I'm excited to activate the for the waves sculpture at other events and see it, what becomes of it and what's, you know, what reach it can have. And also ha- find a little better work life balance, uh, with my fiance and, and family. So that, that, and actually get more waves. That would be pretty nice. Yeah. Go back to surfing. You're a good surfer. I appreciate that. I I would (laughs) like to continue to surf. Yeah. (laughs) That's a good goal. And I, last thing I want to say is that uh, I you mentioned the power of surfing to bring people together. And I'm very grateful to WSL and WSL Pure for for creating this platform to share these ideas and not be just scared of something that somebody could perceive as being negative about golf. And it's not. And, you know, you guys are open to that. And that takes a lot of courage as an institution to say yes. Um, Also, the sculpture didn't exist. You didn't really know what you were going to get. So I really appreciate the, the, you know, you took a leap of faith with us and I'm excited it's gone really well. So thanks for leveraging the power of surfing to, uh, to reach people. Well, thanks, man. I mean, you know, we, uh, we see it as we have a platform and so it's an, it's a responsibility for us to engage with the communities that we care about and, uh, talk about the issues we care about. You know, the ocean is core to who we are and what we do. And so, um, yeah, we, we gotta do that. We gotta have a platform and we believe in your work. So, you know, that was easy. I mean, that was the easy part. It was only really scary that last 48 hours. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to have to push back uh, six hours. Uh, the hitch isn't working. The the way was supposed to show up on a Thursday, (laughs) then Friday, then Saturday. It was a all nighter Friday night at the Surf Ranch parking lot. It worked out. Yeah, you did it, man. It was you pulled last it off. minute. You Jeez. pulled it off. It was really incredible. Thank you for believing in us. Of it course, was gnarly. Man. Of course. Yeah. Um, anything else? No. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, you can all check the show notes for uh, videos of this uh, this project. Check out for the waves. Um, check out Ethan's website. Check out Countercurrent Art, his nonprofit that he does a lot of these projects through. Check out the plastic pickup. Um, tons of stuff in the show notes to learn more about this project and how you can, uh, you know, do your part. Cool. Thanks, Reese. Thanks, Ethan. Stoked. We're such fans of Ethan's work. He's such a genuine spirit. He's so smart and so dedicated to the cause and to his work. Ethan and a number of our WCL Pure partners are actually back at it again on the North Shore this month for the Vans Triple Crown of Surfing and Billabong Pipeline Masters. Ethan and our friends at Kukua Hawaii Foundation and Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii uh, will have some artwork and a call to action to catch a plastic-free wave at Pipeline. And this year, they're going to be joined by legendary waterman Mark Cunningham, who will be part of the project and showing off his artwork. So if you're on the North Shore for the events, I definitely recommend you check it out during Pipeline. They'll be at the Ehukai Beach Park. Or look for our coverage at WSL Pure and at all the above social handles, um, Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii and Kakua Hawaii Foundation. Now, let's do a quick check of the old inbox and social feeds for Flotsam and Jetsam, see whatever floated our way this week. Um, I'm flying solo. The team is spread out for the holidays and off in Hawaii for the final events of the year, so just me. Um, First up, we have the climate strikes. Now, the climate strikes have been happening every Friday since Greta Thunberg started 60-some-odd weeks ago. But this week is particularly important because the UN Climate uh, Convention is happening in Spain. And the youth movement really wants to put pressure on governments to take bold action. So they're really rallying for December 6th. It's going to be a big one. I highly encourage you to attend. In the U.S., I know that there are a number of groups, including Sunrise Movement. If you can go to sunrisemovement.org slash climate strike to find a strike near you. In Australia, Climate Council has been really, really engaged. Another great group rallying students. So if you haven't been, they're super fun. A great way to be a part of a group and a community calling for action. So go find a strike near you. On December 7th, the North Shore Community Land Trust uh, has their annual benefit for the country. And the North Shore Community Land Trust is a partner of ours at WSL Pure. Great group doing great work to protect Hawaii and their coastal habitat. And, you know, you might not live in Hawaii, but maybe you go there. Maybe you've been there for a surf trip. Maybe, you know, um, you hope to go there someday. And that's why I think it's important that we all kind of band together and support these different groups. And so um, they do amazing work and their annual benefits really cool. If you're there, I, I highly encourage you to go. If you can't make it or you're not there, then, you know, check them out online, support online. In Ocean News this week, there's a great article in the New York Times by Kendra Pierre Lewis called Warming Waters, Moving Fish, How Climate Change is Reshaping Iceland. It's a fascinating read on what happens to a fish population uh, due to climate change. The ocean is warming up. That means that there's less oxygen. So fish are moving to colder, more nutrient-dense water, 
where there's more oxygen, more more uh, habitable for them to live and survive in. And that's creating essentially geopolitical issues because as a government, the government of Iceland is saying, okay, wait a second, where are our fish going? And how does that interoperate with the other governments in the area? And so it's a really fascinating uh, look at what happens when we start to see these effects. Along the same lines, Coal New is an interesting article in Huffington Post sent in by Ryan Bucci talking about how the coal industry knew. They knew all along. Not a surprise, but it is good to see that there's data behind that. Finally, some ocean optimism. The San Diego Union Tribune is reporting that vaquita porpoises, which are highly, highly, highly endangered, maybe as few as 30 or so in the world, were seen with calves this year. Uh, researchers who went down to Mexico to check out the vaquita porpoise, and if you don't know about them, I, I recommend you look them up. It's an endangered species. But the researchers that went down there and checked them out saw, wait a second, they're, they're reproducing. This is a really good sign. And thanks to our friend April Wong for sending that in. Really, really cool. We don't know the outcome of Bill 40. That's the final one. Bill 40 in Hawaii is a really important bill that's going to ban single-use plastics. The news should drop today, so we'll update with that next week. But um, we're rooting for all of you out there on the North Shore working to protect Hawaii from plastic pollution. That's it for this week. If you like what we're up to here, please rate, review, share. It really does help more people discover the podcast and increase our collective ocean knowledge. And we'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, we hope all is swell in your little corner of the ocean. See you soon.